John Vermoon at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Prior to that, an active as professor in, in the Netherlands, who joined the UK for two, three years ago. Yep. He is an eminent scholar in uh, studying, research, uh, studying uh, learning and teaching processes and teaching and learning strategies. He is uh, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Learning and Instruction, and it's our pleasure to host him here today to enlighten us about processes and strategies of student and teacher learning. So Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, does the mic work? Yeah? I think, okay, great. Um, thank you for inviting me, Lars, to this symposium. It, uh, I saw the program for today, and uh, I, I thought it was really an interesting uh, collection of uh, papers on this issue of um, intrapersonal research. Um, as Lars said, I will start with, with uh, let's say, a more theoretical model of teacher learning uh, and student learning um, and, and uh, use some examples of the research we have been doing over the last couple of years uh, in this area. Um, first of all, uh, as Lars said, I'm, I'm now based in Cambridge. Uh, this is my favorite spot in the city and if you, if you know, I mean it's, it is a little bit similar to something here in this city. I was here as a tourist a couple of times <laughs> and I saw this bridge but it, uh, under this bridge you can go by boat and that's not possible with your bridge here in Cambridge. <laughs> um, uh, I, I understand there are rowing competitions between Oxford and Cambridge already for a very long time. I understand that Cambridge hasn't done that well over the last couple of years, but the advantage of long time series is that it doesn't influence the average so much if you, <laughs> if you are defeated a couple of times. But the Cambridge people are much better in punting, <coughs> you see, so maybe next time we shouldn't row but punt, and then on the cam, and I'm sure we will beat you. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> what, oh yeah. There's one thing, I just uh, took a glance uh, in the uh, package <coughs> and the organizers seem to have incorporated an experiment, a randomized control trial, because <laughs> the order of the slides is slightly different in your package than I have them in my PowerPoint presentation. So you have to uh, go back and forth a, a little bit. This, this is the right order. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what I, I try to do today is uh, share with you um, some current models on uh, teacher and student learning and I'm especially interested, I did my PhD on student learning, uh, later on I went to Leiden University in the Netherlands where I started to focus on teacher learning and teacher professional development and since I'm uh, based in Cambridge um, I'm very interested in trying to bring together mm -hmm models of teacher learning and student learning. Actually, it's quite awkward that these fields of research are so separated. Uh, they are separated in different divisions in our professional organizations like IRA and early. You have a division on teaching and teacher education. There's a division on learning and instruction and people hardly communicate uh, together. And I think to really influence, to have some impact on educational practice. We should study these processes much more in coherence. And nowadays, even funding agencies put more emphasis, for example, if you do research on teacher professional development, on pedagogical models of teacher professional development, that you incorporate some measures of student learning as well, so that you don't only demonstrate that teachers learn, but that, that has some impact on student learning as well, and maybe the other way around. It is a, uh, a new, a pretty new uh, perspective, uh, uh, but I think it's very important. And it is more complicated than just focusing on either student and teacher learning. Okay, so I was struck by uh, these kind of phenomena. Why does research on learning and instruction often have so little impact on teachers and teaching? Or the other way around, 
why does research on teaching and teacher education often have so little impact on student learning? And I think this, has, this may have many reasons, but one of the reasons is that in, in the organization of our scientific endeavor within educational research, we, we, in, we, we intend or we, we separate actually our, our, our focus in the organizations, in the journals, in many other ways. And I think that's not a good thing, and I think it's, it's good to try to bring them all together. And one way of bringing them together is seeing whether we can use similar models of describing and explaining student learning uh, uh, and, and teacher learning, or whether we need actually different models. Is teacher learning so different or more professional learning in general, adult professional learning? Is it so different from children's learning, from student learning, that we need different theories and different models to explain and describe? Or are there similarities between the two so much that we can actually use similar models which would make it much easier to study those processes in coherence? <coughs> so the basic model, uh, when you look in the literature on current models of teacher professional development, and fortunately, there are some people who have done that for us. For example, uh, Van Veen and colleagues, or uh, uh, Desimone from the States, they have written nice overview articles about uh, teacher professional development. And basically, the model is a little bit like this. There are, there's an intervention, a certain pedagogical way of fostering teacher professional development. It can be a kind of reflection model, it can be a knowledge-based model, it can be any, anything. Uh, the model is applied and that, that intervention, that training program, teacher education program, for example, leads to certain changes in teacher quality. Hopefully an increase, sometimes a decrease, you never know, but you intend an increase. Uh, the teachers get more knowledge, more skills, and a better attitude towards teaching, or the, this particular model of teaching. Uh, not automatically, but hopefully, that leads to change in teacher behavior in the classroom, which hopefully leads to improvement of student results. So this is actually the basic model that you find in the literature, and is all under some school organizational conditions. There's a message coming from Finland. They cannot see something. Uh, my colleagues, uh, our colleagues, uh, they, uh, as, as a kind of uh, exercise, they studied the literature and they looked in the field of science teaching uh, how many studies there were that studied these different links between the elements of the model. And what they found was that uh, they found 44 studies that, uh, uh, that fulfilled all the inclusion criteria and of those 44, there were three who looked at the relation between the intervention and changes in teaching behavior. So uh, skipping the second box, so between the first and the third box. There were four who looked at the intervention, uh, the relation between intervention and changes in teacher knowledge, uh, which is the first and a part of the second box. Half of them looked at the relation between the intervention, changes in teacher knowledge and changes in teacher classroom behavior, which is the first three actually, at least part of the knowledge part, and then three of them. Uh, nine looked at all four, but the fourth only in terms of impressions teachers had about the gains that students had achieved. So they asked the teachers, do you think that your students have improved in mathematical knowledge, for example? And then they said yes, and that was the measure of a student learning outcome. And there were only six of the 44, so 14% who actually combined all four uh, elements of the model and included student achievement tests to represent the last box. So only a very small percentage actually included this whole chain of causation from 
teacher professional learning to improvement in student learning outcomes. Okay. Uh, so a relatively small proportion uh, of the studies actually incorporate in the four elements of this model. But then this model is actually also a black box model because it says nothing about the processes of student learning and teacher learning. And that was already uh, 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 people in New Zealand, Temperley et al, uh, noticed it for the first time that actually this kind of models there, there's something important missing and that missing that black box is what I have been focusing on for today. Because if you reorganize the elements of the model, here you have the same 4-1, you have the features of the intervention, increase in teacher quality, change in teaching behavior, improvement of student results, the same 4 as in the brown model, but this is a more colorful model. It's blue, green, and yellow. And these colors are not random, as you will see. So if you, so if you reorganize these a little bit, then you see that actually they describe two elements. They describe learning environments, and they describe learning outcomes. Eh? So features of the intervention for the teacher, and that change in classroom behavior, uh, those are both representing learning environments and teach increase in teacher quality, improvement of student uh, results are both elements of uh, learning outcomes on different layers. So there is a teacher layer describing what happens in the teacher and there's a student layer describing what happens in uh, the student. And of course the change in teaching behavior is an element of the learning environment for the students. The teacher is maybe the most important element of the student's learning environment. And what is missing here is actually the process. Uh, the, the thing that transfers one state to the other state. What is happening in between? This is a kind of behavioristic model. There's something, there's an environment, there's an outcome, but we don't know how the environment leads to this certain outcome. And actually, that's a very old behavioristic model, not describing the thinking and learning processes that go on to go from the learning environment to the learning outcomes. And yet, we know quite a lot about it. So what I would suggest is to change the model, to make it slightly more complicated, but to include actually very important processes, the processes of student learning and teacher learning. And there are all kinds of relations between those elements. In the first version we had only arrows from left to right, from teacher professional development all the way to student learning outcomes, but that's probably too mechanistic and, and I think it's more realistic to have all kinds of interrelations between the layer of student learning and the layer of teacher learning. Much better now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and what I want to share, yeah, actually it's more complicated, of course, uh, because we are, I mean, the teacher and the student are just two persons. If we go a little bit further and include, for example, the work of teacher education, where you have teacher educators educating the teachers, you need another layer of the teacher educator, uh, which is the red one here which is quite similar, of course. Also, uh, we, we don't educate our teacher educators most of the time. They are supposed to, to know what to do to educate teachers. There are some emerging initiatives now for, for training programs of teacher educators, but it's quite rare, but it's beginning. But in fact, of course, you have another layer, but this makes it more complicated, and I always think that you first have to understand the less complicated models before you can go any further. As you can see, the colors are not random because green is a mixture of yellow and blue and purple is a mixture of blue and red. I've been thinking a long time about this model. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start, I would say, with the more complicated one, uh, the, the less complicated one. And then first focus on how students learn. And actually, there's in the literature quite a lot of knowledge 
a lot of research reported on how students learn, processes of student learning. And the model we use to describe this process is depicted here. Uh, students in the center is what we call a learning pattern, uh, which represent the interrelationship between these elements. Learning activities are things students do to learn. Let's say they memorize the material or they think critically about two theories or they try to think of concrete examples or they try uh, to, um, uh, to understand the material, all kind of those uh, learning processes in terms of deep surface concrete <coughs> processing. There's a whole lot of, a whole lot of literature on, on that aspect of student learning. The most well-known probably the distinction between deep and surface processing uh, by Martin and Selye uh, from Göteborg. Uh, this way of learning is regulated by another type of learning processes, regulation processes. There's a body of knowledge on metacognition, self-regulated learning, and then you talk about how students plan their learning, how they monitor their learning progress, how they test their understanding, how they evaluate their own learning, how they reflect on their learning processes. So again, mental, cognitive processes, but of a different nature than the processes uh, captured on the learning activities. And the way they regulate their learning steers their learning activities. And that regulation of learning is influenced by their conceptions of learning. Again, a Göteborg group uh, led by Roger Selye has done a lot of work on this. Uh, the way people think about learning. So if you ask people what do you actually understand by learning, and you get all these answers and you try to categorize them, you see that they are quite different, that people understand. They use the word learning all the time, but they mean very, very different things when they talk about learning. Varying from learning as an accumulation of facts, for example, to learning as a personal change. And learning is, of course, influenced by student motivations. There's a big body of literature on the, on the importance of student motivation and different motivations. They lead to different learning processes. A more intrinsic motivation leads to more deep learning, self-regulated learning. More extrinsic motivation leads to more, let's say, externally regulated learning and often more surface uh, processes. And this all leads to learning outcomes and is influenced by more personal factors like intelligence, for example, uh, uh, personality maybe, and contextual factors among which are the learning environment and the way of assessment. So we know a lot about it. A learning pattern is the interconnection of the whole. Very often there are strong relations between conceptions, motives, regulation and learning, or in other words, between what people do, what people want and what they think. Those are basic elements that are often closely linked and when the link is broken, it often are problems. When people behave in different ways as they are motivated or as they think would be a good way of learning, then there are often strong emotional reactions. Sari Lindblom in Helsinki, for example, she studied medical students uh, in a traditional medical curriculum, which was very much focused on, on road learning of very basic medical knowledge. Uh, this was not a way of learning that in the view of many students was the best way to become a good doctor. And there was a strong tension actually between the behavior in which they were forced and their own beliefs about good learning that they thought were appropriate to become a doctor. And this gave very emotional reactions. Um, okay, I won't go too deeply into it now. Uh, uh, there is, if you want to read something new, this is a new book, 2014, which summarizes a lot of the research on learning patterns in higher education. I was one of the co-editors, as you may may be able to read, uh, and which uh, goes into a lot of these uh, things. Um, yeah, in, in this type of research, uh, we often find 
four basic different ways of learning, uh, which will be very, uh, everybody who, who has spent some time in education will recognize them, more reproduction directed, so a way of learning aimed at remembering as much as possible to be able to reproduce it on an examination, a very common form of learning. Meaning directed learning more aimed at trying to gain understanding of the study material, self-regulated learning, intrinsic motivation, a view of learning in which personal responsibility is very important. Application directed learning where people try to try to get applicable, usable knowledge in their view, knowledge is only worthwhile when they can use it, when they learn to apply it. And undirected learning, often uh, people who do not know very well how to learn in a new environment. For example, when they go from secondary to higher education, you often see it when an institution uh, decides to uh, use a new learning model like problem-based learning, students have to adapt and it often takes quite a time for students to adapt to a totally new way of teaching. And then people start to thinking whether they are able to do it, they, they try to uh, adapt to the system, it doesn't work, etc., etc. So in student learning we find often find these basic ways of learning. And I want to go a little bit deeper now uh, into this student learning. So often we see in a student career from a more longitudinal perspective uh, important transitions. There are certain points in students' careers where students have to make changes. And these are, for example, moving from secondary to higher education, moving from higher education to the workplace. You see increasingly the tendency that students choose master studies which are very different from the bachelors. You do a bachelor in biology, and you do a master in education, for example. Uh, you see that students are increasingly internationally mobile, uh, coming from all kinds of countries to other countries where there are different cultures, educational cultures, and they have to adapt to uh, brought up in their home country to adapt to a new environment. In Cambridge we have many international students and you see it every day in my supervisions uh, that there are students who are not used to this system of very critical engagement with the literature that they have to show all the time in their Cambridge essays. And some students are not just not used to it from their previous university. And there are second career switches nowadays. Some people, after some time, they, they decide to do another job. And that's, again, an important transition. And there are transitions that are not so much from a longitudinal perspective, students moving into new phases, but having to do with almost daily changes, daily adaptations, daily switches that people have to make. For example, in professional learning, combining theory and practice. Many professional programs are designed in such a way that you do a part of your study at the university or in school and another part in the workplace. And workplace learning is much based on experiential learning. Uh, school learning is different and people have to make the switch all the time. We see it in teacher education, in medical education, in law education, in all types of vocational education. We ourselves as university lecturers have to combine theory, uh, research and teaching, for example, which is a totally different mindset. You can't, I, at least I can't do both things on one day. So I need different days, actually, because as a researcher you have to focus very much and as a teacher you have to think of hundreds of things at the same time. My mind can't cope with that, at least not on the same day. Uh, and the combi combination of study uh, of majors and minors of a very different nature. Uh, so my daughter does biology, but she does a minor in business, for example, which are two very different uh, types of study and with very different implicit cultures and different asking different ways of studying from their students. And this is all not very easy. 
So we did with our PSE students, this is still studies based in the Netherlands, um, we did studies on from both kind of perspectives. And the first one I want to share with you is a growth and development perspective. Uh, when you do longitudinal studies and measure these elements of student learning, let's say there, there's learning strategies, uh, there's often the puzzling phenomenon that people do not develop very hard when the, when the environment is pretty stable. Um, and one of the explanations, and you also see it with teachers, so teachers in, 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 let's say, when you take a year and you follow those teachers, you have multiple measurements, uh, and you, you look at the beginning and the end, and you average your measurements at both points, and you compare them, uh, often the, the changes that you see are a little bit disappointing. And uh, many people have been puzzled by that phenomenon. And I think some advantage in this field now are that we are beginning to use different models than we used to do. That we tr th begin to understand that linear developments are only one case of development and that there are mm -hmm. other types of development actually when you have multiple measurements that better model what is actually going on. For example, quadratic growth models. And uh, if you depict it, so this is from uh, one of the studies that we have been doing, uh, there can be different things can be going on. If you look very carefully here, you see a red line uh, going a little bit down, uh, and which represents the mean. And uh, you see all kind of other lines which represent the predicted values under different uh, models. And what is happening here, for example, is that the mean does not show that much of a difference when you compare the beginning and the end. But on an individual level, you see that the variation is growing and growing. So there is something important is happening here, but it is not captured by just the comparison of average scores on the measurement scales, which is represented by the red line. So if we don't look carefully for these phenomena, we can't see them without traditional models. Because it's important when variation growth, it may be an important effect of any intervention. This is another one. Again, there's a red line, a little bit hidden. But if you see the first and the third measurement, in this case, there would not be a very big difference between the two means. But here you see that from time point one to time point two, there's an increase for almost all individuals. And then from two to three, it goes down a little bit. And on the end, in the end, the average difference is neglectable. Here, this is a kind of quadratic growth model where there is a, an increase in this important variable, in this example, a certain view from time point one to time point two and a slight decrease in three. And especially in motivational research, you often see these kind of developments, that in the beginning, people get more motivated, but that at a certain point in school careers, motivation decreases, for example. It's actually, it's more common than a steadily increase in motivation or decrease throughout the years. And again, our simple models of just comparing linear, just representing linear growth, do not represent this accurately. From another study from our Belgium colleagues, uh, we see uh, a little bit the reverse. Here were uh, four measurement points, uh, and this is also a, a kind of reverse quadratic model. First a decline, then uh, staying steadily, and then again a little bit of a decrease, uh, an increase, sorry. And the fourth one, again, an inverse phenomenon compared to the first uh, diagram, the first figure, where in the beginning there's much more variation, and here the effect of the intervention is actually a decrease in the variation. Students become more similar as a result of the intervention. And again, the mean doesn't represent that phenomenon, but if you look at the individual pictures and you apply more advanced 
statistical modeling, you can actually see that this is a better representation of what's happening here. So our statistical models uh, may be sometimes maybe too simple to represent these developments in time. Another study that we have been doing is research from this simultaneous perspective, where people have to combine almost on a daily basis different types of learning environment, which ask different things from the students. In this example, it was in a teacher education program, and as you know, in many teacher education programs, uh, they are a kind of dual programs where uh, students have to go for, let's say, uh, on a weekly basis, go on a Monday, they go to the institute for teaching, the university. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they go to school to practice their teaching and to talk with experienced teachers in the school. But they have a mentor who supervises their experiential learning. And on Friday, they come back to the university they are in mentor groups and they discuss their practical experiences and they try to relate their practical experiences to the knowledge they have acquired through studying the literature. This is a very common model nowadays and, and it is a very difficult way of learning, but a very common way. It's very difficult to combine your experiential knowledge with more theoretical knowledge. Sometimes we, we were totally uh, surprised that when students read the book about keeping order in the classroom uh, and they were trying to do it in the classroom they they perceived it as two totally different things and they thought that the book had no relevance at all to what they were seeing in the classroom and the other way around so the language in which these different types of learning conceptualize the knowledge seemed to be so different that uh, that it's very hard to combine. And actually, that's what we try to do. Yes, thank you. In this study, we uh, ask student teachers to uh, three times in a year to um, describe learning experiences, six learning experiences they had in a certain period. A couple of them had to come from the practice school, a couple of them had to come from the university, and a couple they could choose. Uh, first of all, it, was, uh, it were open questions, so we had questions like uh, uh, what, what, what have you learned today, what have you learned, uh, were there people involved, uh, a couple of pretty simple but direct questions about their learning experience, and they answered it, we categorized it all, and uh, transformed the categories into numerical values. And enter that in what we call a multiple correspondence analysis, which is a kind of factor analysis for categorical data for the experts among you. And uh, without going into detail about the technique, it's what comes out of it are dimensions underlying those experiences. And in this example, there were two main dimensions coming out of the analysis, active versus passive regulation, prospective versus retrospective regulation. So active versus passive means that active, then you have to regulate your own learning. And passive means that other people or, or things in the environment actually regulate your learning. Prospective means regulating ahead. So let's say planning your learning experiences. Retrospective means more looking back on what has happened. So reflection is an example of a retrospective way of regulating. And what we could see in those analyses, these are individual pictures, so individual students uh, who differ on these dimensions. Uh, and for example, uh, the left student who is uh, more on the passive end, you can say, overall. Uh, and most of the learning experiences are passive and retrospective, while on the right there's a student who is more active overall and again, more retrospective in, in the learning experiences. Um, this is another one, more prospective on the left side. All six learning experiences 
are very much looking ahead and on the right one uh, is, is an example of a more retrospective one where all the learning experiences are characterized more by looking back. And then we had so six learning experiences per phase, uh, three phases in a year, so we collected 18 of these learning experiences from the same students. And I think that's very much what this whole day is about. How can you collect multiple measurements from individual students or teachers or persons more broadly? And how can you make sense of these different measurements? And this is just one of the examples from student learning. Okay. I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, I get strict directions here from the chair and want to move to teacher learning. So when, when we began to focus on teacher learning, we thought it would be valuable to use a similar model actually than is dominant in the field of student learning, but then use it for teacher learning. So you will notice that this is a very similar model. The color is different, it's blue, but that's actually the main difference. And what we try to do later on, Mike and Dijk and me, is look in the literature what is known about the different elements of the model in the literature and what is known about relations between the elements of the model. And not surprisingly, there's much less known about teacher learning than there is about student learning. So we, we found enough to write a first article about it, but this is a field of research that is really worthwhile to delve into. And one of the things we did was, for example, uh, there was a big innovation, educational innovation project in the Netherlands where the Ministry of Education had ordered that the whole upper phase of secondary education should be more characterized by active and self-regulated student learning. So for some way, this is actually based on research on student learning, the importance of metacognition, self-regulated learning, active learning, and the minister had picked that up and she said it would be a good thing that the whole system changes in the country and teachers begin to teach more in that specific way. What was forgotten then and what is forgotten in many of these innovations that you that this is an enormous demand on teacher learning. So what mostly happens is that uh, the idea is embraced, uh, there is, there is a, a kind of manual is written, we are going to do it differently from September onwards and then teachers have to find out how to do it. And that this is an intensive teacher learning process, not only learning a couple of skills, but almost changing the whole identity, it is often totally neglected. So we followed the teachers uh, uh, during a year, and we asked them six times a year to email a learning experience to us. Uh, and we, it was represented by this figure. It was a kind of plastified card that they could stick to their computer and this was what they had to email us about. So a kind of learning experience. They could write about what they learned. They could write about their thoughts when they were learning it, their concerns, their feelings, uh, what they thought was the course of the learning experience, how they had learned it, what the relation was with self-regulated learning, who else was involved, those kind of things. And they emailed us back hundred teachers, six times a year. There were long stories, short stories. There was no structure furthermore, but they were all very intensive narratives of their learning experience in the context of having to change their work, the way they worked quite profoundly from didactic teaching to supporting active and self-regulated student learning, which is a big, huge difference. And they were emotional stories, they were rational stories, everything. It was fantastically interesting to analyze them. And we did it with three PhD students, a postdoc, and some supervisors. Uh, uh, it was enormously interesting work. We found six basic 
learning activities. Teachers like to experiment a lot. They learn a lot through trying out things differently. They learn from considering their own practice, of thinking about their practice. They learn from getting ideas from others, but this is not as important as in, let's say, regular uh, university learning. And there were a lot of learning experiences which were not that positive, let's say. They experienced a lot of friction. They wanted to do things which did not work out as they had thought they would work out. They got frustrated. They struggled not to refer to old ways. They tried to do it in a new way and then unconsciously they went back to their old way of teaching. And they suddenly realized and thought, this is not the way I want to do it, I want to do it differently. And some were even avoiding learning uh, very explicitly. They thought this whole idea of self-regulated learning, learning was utmost stupid and they didn't want to teach in that way. And if you uh, count it, so we found in those e emails 700 learning experiences. You see many of them experimenting, considering own practice, getting ideas from others, but also many frictions that they experience with strong emotions uh, going by it. <coughs> I have to uh, even stop is the <laughs> instruction. So I, unfortunately, I have to skip uh, a couple of things now. I have to skip our project in London that we are doing around lesson study, studying um, teacher learning where we have a series of cycles where teachers go through in developing their mathematical practice. We videotape all these um, uh, sessions, these discussions and try to look for evidence of teacher learning. Uh, we do it together with Maria Vricky who is over there and colleagues uh, Neil Mercer and uh, Paul Warwick. And we are in the middle of that, trying to make sense of those videotapes to detect evidence of teacher learning. Unfortunately, this is all very interesting, but I have to <laughs> go on uh, to end here. <laughs> so uh, to end with some conclusions and implications, I'll be short. I think a new generation of learning theories will have a multi-layer character, and it will not be enough to develop sub-theories for different populations but the interdependence and interrelationship of the sub-theories will be the most important feature of the learning theory itself. So how it connects, how teacher and learning, uh, teacher and student learning, and maybe including uh, uh, principal learning or, or school head learning or school organization learning in a more interrelated way, I think that's needed to have more impact on practice. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and a challenge for research is how we can study this whole multi-layer model uh, of student and teacher learning as a whole, because it's often quite complicated. It takes some time between, uh, let's say, student, uh, between teacher professional development and uh, improved student uh, outcomes. So we can cut the model into pieces and study them differently. We can develop longer research projects. We can bring together researchers from the different fields and we can develop interconnected projects in which both student and teacher learning have a place. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know exactly, uh, maybe a combination of all. And this is where I have to stop. Thank you very much.